Good afternoon in the US and good evening in Greece. Uh, my name is Stratos of the Mio and I'm the Consul General of Greece in Boston. I want to thank you all for attending this special celebratory lecture of Professor Mark Mazauer on the occasion of the Greek Revolution's bicentennial. This lecture is under the auspices of the Embassy of Greece in Washington and is co-organized co by the Consulate General of Greece in Boston and the College here in Athens, which kindly offers us its virtual and digital hospitality. Without further ado, I would like to uh, give the virtual floor to the Ambassador of Greece in the United States, Mrs. Alexandra Papadopoulou, whom I would like to thank for embracing this uh, special event, for creating the conditions under which uh, this initiative could take place and for honoring us with her presence. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Eftimiou. I would like to thank our college here in Athens for 50 years of service in education and culture, and also the Philactopoulos family for being the initiators and guardians of such an important project. Of course, I would like to thank the Consulate General of Greece in Boston and uh, my dear colleague, Stratos of Thimiu, for his exceptional work. He's been one of the best and the brightest diplomats of his generation, and uh, his work in Boston has been exceptional. Dr. Prevelakis, it has been an honor to meet you when I was in, uh, in Boston, and I'm really one of your admirers for the great work you do at the Center of Learning Studies in Harvard and Professor Mazauer. I've been reading your books uh, since uh, for over 15 years now, since the first day I set foot on the Balkans. You helped me understand and realize the Balkans uh, and through your books, uh, I managed uh, to understand better the history of Europe and also the history of Greece. All these years that I served in the Balkans uh, and reading your books, uh, a lot of times I thought uh, why the peoples of the Balkans had a different uh, way to national, uh, national identity to find to creating a statehood uh, after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Why Greece uh, and the people in the Balkans followed different paths uh, and had a different timeline uh, when it came to this to statehood. Uh, of course, there are many differences between the different nations in the Balkans, uh, and uh, this is another uh, this topic of another lecture. But the story of the Greek Revolution of 1821, uh, there is no denying that served as an inspiration for the other people there. And there are many reasons uh, why this happened. I understand, especially in our times, uh, that all historical events uh, have different meanings, have different interpretations. Uh, and a lot of people can analyze them uh, from various aspects. Uh, I'm not one who says, uh, of course, I'm not an historian, uh, that uh, history has to be rewritten. But I um, belong to the people who believe uh, that history has to be analyzed constantly. Because every time we understand uh, a different point of view, and every time we try to draw lessons uh, from our past, uh, from our history, for what, why something was done, uh, why it was successful, why it was not successful. The Greek War of Independence in 1821 that, uh, that we celebrate this year is an, an event in history, a, a cardinal event in Greek history, but an important event in European history that has been analyzed many times. Uh, and every time this uh, draws controversy or draws agreement. It's an event that has been relevant to Greece uh, for all these years. Uh, but it's an event that shapes our national identity and our statehood even today. I'm really excited. I'm looking forward to hearing the analysis by Dr. Mazauer and Dr. Prevelakis on the fascinating take they're going to take, I'm sure, about how today's historians view the event, how they analyze it, and how they value it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Ambassador, for your remarks and for your uh, continued support. Uh, I would like to thank and invite uh, Mr. Alexis Philaktopoulos, who is the co-host of today's uh, event. Uh, Mr. Philaktopoulos is the president of the College Year in Athens, a leading nonprofit educational institution which was founded here in Massachusetts six decades ago. Under Alexis' leadership, the CYA has been acting as a cultural and educational bridge uh, between the US and Greece, 
the founder of uh, the CYA is Mini Filaktopoulou and its uh, great supporters such as George and Daphne Hadjopoulos had the vision to promote Greece as an educational uh, destination. Uh, this is a vision shared uh, by the Greek government, by also our uh, distinguished speakers, professors Mazauer and Revelakis, and their uh, respective prestigious academic institutions. Uh, Professor Mazauer, it is a great honor to have you here today. Thank you for uh, accepting our invitation. Uh, Professor Prevelakis, uh, thank you and congratulations for your upcoming academic promotion as senior lecturer in social studies at Harvard University. Uh, Alexis, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Papadopoulou, <laughs> for saluting this celebratory lecture on the occasion of the bicentennial of the Greek War of Independence. And thank you, uh, uh, Strato, for your hospitality today and for agreeing to co-host this event uh, with CYA and for all the good words you said about uh, our institution. Um, today, we have the honor of having with us uh, two exceptional academics, uh, Professor Mark Mazauer and Professor Nicholas Prevelakis. It is uh, difficult to try to paint the portrait of a scholar of the magnitude of uh, Mark Mazar, truly a, a towering figure in his field. Mark Mazar is the Ira D. Wallach Professor of History at Columbia University and director of the Columbia Institute for Ideas and Imagination in Paris and the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Public Humanities Initiative. Mark is an historian of modern Greece and a prolific writer. He has written on the Nazi occupation of Greece, on the multi-ethnic, multicultural um, history of Salonika. He has written on the history of the Balkans, on the Nazi rule in occupied Europe, and also a book on international institutions. This is when he took a look, I understand, at the mix of world history and international government. Finally, he's come up with a, a gem of a book, his most recent one, titled, What You Did Not Tell. What, what you did not tell, what you did not tell, which relates the story of his father's uh, family through the life of his paternal grandfather, Max, and the family's journey uh, out of revolutionary Russia and final settlements in England. He made a statement in an interview I read that this was written for his family, really, and he was quite surprised that there were people interested in, 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 in this uh, rather intimate account. Well, he should not be surprised because the eloquent and captivating style of this uh, family uh, narrative makes for uh, a fascinating, uh, fascinating reading, and I recommend it. His current, current labor of love is uh, a book that will be published by Penguin in uh, uh, later this year on the Greek War of Independence. It's going to be called The Greek Revolution, 1821, and the Making of Modern Greece. This is roughly the uh, subject and what he will focus his, um, uh, what he will focus his talk tonight. Uh, at this present time of world agony and confusion, when uncertainty prevails and facts are misrepresented, and news is sometimes real and oftentimes not. It is important to be able to hear a clear voice like Mark Mazars, who has the gift of a critical historical eye. Serving as the discussant will be Nicholas Prevelakis, Assistant Director of Curricular Development at the Center for Hellenic Studies and uh, 
a senior, I understand, lecturer on social studies at Harvard University. Nicholas is also a member of CYA's Academic Advisory Roundtable. Nicola, Nicola rather, the floor is yours. Good morning or good afternoon to, uh, to everyone. Uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Papadopoulou, uh, Consul General Stratos Eftimiu, and dear friend, uh, Mr. Philaktopoulos, thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, thank you also for your congratulations, even though promotion is not um, formal yet. Um, it's a great honor uh, to be uh, serving as, uh, as discussant in this panel uh, and in conversation with uh, Professor Mark Mazauer. I'm not a historian myself, as I'm, I'm a political theorist and, and a sociologist. I'll be mostly, uh, I think, asking questions uh, and, uh, and benefiting from um, uh, Professor Mazauer's uh, wisdom. Um, we will um, be talking about 1821, uh, about what it means, about what happened there, uh, mostly about uh, recent uh, historical work on uh, the period that many uh, people may not know of, uh, what has been done, uh, what remains to be done in terms of research, what the events and what the Greek Revolution meant, uh, uh, what it has to say about nationalism, ethnicity, religion and politics in the region and beyond, and, and also what how the past uh, informs the narratives that we use to understand the world in which we live um, today. Uh, before we start, uh, just some administrative um, uh, information. Uh, if you have any questions, please use the Zoom uh, Q&A um, um, platform. And so uh, in the Q&A sessions, we'll make sure uh, or we'll make every effort so that your question uh, is heard. Uh, and if you are on YouTube, you can also use the comments questions uh, on YouTube and we'll do the best uh, to address your question. Uh, we will have half an hour of discussion with Professor Mazauer, at the end of which we'll go to a 15 minute uh, Q&A uh, session. So um, again, if you, have, uh, if you have thoughts, if you have questions, I encourage you to uh, uh, write them now, sooner rather than later, uh, so that we can process them um, in time. Uh, with that said, uh, Professor Mazauer, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, and my first question has to do with uh, your um, uh, upcoming book that uh, Mr. Philaktopoulos talked about. Can you tell us about that book? What inspired you to um, uh, 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 engage with um, uh, the Greek Revolution and, and what can we expect from it? Yes, well, let me first uh, thank you, Nicolas. Uh, Madame Ambassador, thank you for the introduction. Dear Consul General, thank you. Um, it's, uh, I don't normally, uh, find anniversaries of uh, any particular emotional significance, but I have to confess that this is one that does. And to, uh, to feel that I'm in dialogue in somehow uh, with, with, with the country uh, whose birth we're celebrating is, is, an, is a moving experience. Um, the, I've just been uh, immersing myself in the subject for the last few years. And I think it grew out of a couple of things, really. Um, the first was the sense that uh, began nearly 10 years ago now, maybe 10 years ago, when austerity hit Greece and there was the Euro crisis, that we were in a phase of world history in which we were no longer sure what sovereignty really meant. It was not at all clear that Greece had preserved its sovereignty under the regime of the Troika. And um, so that made me want to go back to the beginning, to the moment in the 1820s when people were fighting for sovereignty and to ask what they thought they were fighting for. Um, and this sense of using uh, 1821, the history of 1821 as an opportunity to understand the present better I think was only sharpened um, by the events of the last year or so, and by the experience that we've all had of living through a pandemic and seeing the way it tested societies and tested the relationship between uh, societies and suffering and their political leaders. And I've been in New York all this time and the relationship that COVID revealed between American society and its political class was very different uh, from the relationship that emerged in Greece over this time. 
And that struck me as a way of thinking about how societies cope with suffering. And I think Greece is a society that has known great suffering. And this became another way of thinking about 1821, because I started to see that the real clue to understanding the significance of 1821 was that the people endured. It wasn't that something began. It wasn't that a revolution began. We can talk about that. It was that the thing went on longer than anybody expected, longer than the Sultan expected, longer than the Europeans diplomat, European diplomats expected, frankly, longer than many of the so-called heroes of the revolution expected. There was this question of endurance. I can come back to that. Now, what was it then about? Let me just, as a way into this, tell you about an argument I had with my publisher. So, you know, one of the thorny businesses about being an author is titles. And I, I said, look, it's pretty clear what the title should be. The, the, the title should be The Greek Revolution. And um, my dear publisher, for whom I have enormous respect, came back and said, no, 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 that's really not going to work. Um, uh, People in the United States in particular just really have heard of two revolutions. They've heard of their own revolution, they've heard of the French Revolution. They, nobody knows about a Greek revolution. We're going to call it the Greek War of Independence. And I had to explain why I found that unsatisfactory, why this was not a war, uh, why it was a revolution. It was not a war because a war implies a conflict between two organized sides usually fighting in a certain kind of way. This was not a conflict that had a clear beginning, and at least one of the sides was totally disorganized, the Greek, and in fact, the whole problem of organization was the fundamental problem of the revolution next to survival. On the other hand, I said it is not, it is not a war because there was no Greek state and the whole insurrection was designed to produce a Greek state. So you're putting the cart before the horse. Revolution, on the other hand, was firstly a term that was employed at the time, never mind that it's the term that we all use in Greece today. Um, and it was objectively a revolution. The society that came out in 1830 was in all fundamental respects, utterly different from the society of 1820. Uh, and we don't need to go into those, I think it's obvious. And I'm not just talking about the confessional dimension, the introduction of capitalism, the introduction of new system of law, the introduction of new kinds of cities, and so on and so on and so on. The introduction of a European state, it was a revolution. So I, I said it was clearly a revolution, but then there's another dimension to this, and maybe this will lead us into some further questions. Of course, in Greece today, we all talk about the Eleniki Apanastasi, and that was certainly a term that was used at the time by many people, particularly many people of a certain education in and around the Filiki Eteria. But I was always bothered by one thing, which was the thought that for your average member of the average Choryo above Nafpaktos, let us take for an example, or in the middle of the Peloponnese, what did Epanastasi really mean? It meant nothing. The word meant nothing, the word had no meaning. This was part of a European political discourse that had no purchase. And I think my eyes were really open to this um, when I started reading um, an obscure article in Pandora, which was a very interesting 19th century Greek newspaper in which Greek historians used to publish on learned and obscure things from time to time. And they had an article about the very, very first Greek newspaper. As we know, the first printed Greek newspapers emerged in Greece during the revolution because a number of the leaders brought printing presses with them, been unknown before. But this wasn't about those. According to the author of this article, before the first printed newspapers, there had circulated in two or three places handwritten broadsheets summarizing news, which for obvious reasons had mostly failed to survive. And this gave the text of one of those. It had circ been circulated by a member of the Filiki Eteria above Galaxidi. And we could talk about news and fake news. This was to a certain extent fake news. What did this fake news broadsheet do? It was designed to whip up enthusiasm for the insurgency amongst a population that was pretty suspicious. So it told them what? That there's a revolution? No, it didn't mention the word revolution. It said, 
the kings of Francia, of Europe, have decided Nafteaxoneto Romeco. They've decided to make the Romeco. And the whole of this broadsheet was about the making of the Romeco. It was about a language of popular millenarian orthodoxy in which the long awaited triumph of Christ, thanks to the Virgin, was about to become true, and the Sultan was to be chased out of Istanbul. And so I realized that at the very start, it wasn't a revolution either for many of the Greeks. It was making the Romeo. So that's by way of introduction. So wonderful, but thank you. And, and uh, that makes, makes me think that very often um, we tend to, uh, when we go back to the past, interpret the past with the eyes of the present, uh, almost teleologically, see what happened and project it back into the past. Now, if we, if we go to that period, the 1820s, uh, there must have been competing visions, competing goals, competing imaginations about what it was uh, that uh, was about to be achieved. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about, about that if we place ourselves in that moment of uncertainty when history hasn't played out yet? What were these visions? Absolutely, because one of, the, <laughs> one of the things that is so obvious that one tends not to mention it or notice it is that to the best of my knowledge, none of the leaders of the revolution ever articulated at the beginning any specific territorial goals. It was something that's so obvious in the late 19th and 20th century, right? We want the land up to the river X. We want this, we want that. No, nobody was bothering them at that. You, what you got instead from the Filikieteria from Ypsilantis and his supporters in the spring of 1821 is Oli Grecia, all of Greece has risen or is rising which for them included the entire Balkans up to the Danube River Danube and, and beyond the Danube River. And it was somehow analogous to the, to the vision of Rigas Ferreos, it was a pan-Balkan vision with one, I think, crucial difference, which was it was highly charged with a vision of orthodoxy. Whereas as we know, the Rigas Ferreos vision was genuinely ecumenical and it was in that sense, more of a product of the enlightenment. So there is this vision. There is this vision that we are fighting for all the Greeks to rise up, meaning all the world of Orthodox Christendom. In, in other places, it depends who you're talking about. Uh, if you're talking about the, uh, uh, the, the magnates, the landowners of the Peloponnese, it seems often as though what they want is to have what they have already, which is to say control over large numbers of peasants and villages without having to answer to the Sultan. So they want a relatively minor change in the scheme of things. If you, if you go down to the level of the peasants, what they want is not to have the landowners on their back. If you go to uh, Andrutsos and the Armatols of central Greece, they play this very complicated game because there's one situation in the Morea where very quickly it's Christians against Muslims. It's very clear cut. And it's a completely different situation in Rumeli, where it's a three-way struggle at the beginning. It's not a two-way struggle. And the three sides are the Sultan, Ali Pasha, and the Greeks. And the three-way struggle is much less predictable and it's much harder to articulate what you want. So there is this um, plethora of aspirations, which is natural in a revolution. And I think what is interesting is to see a certain, not so much a certain set of aspirations emerge, although they do very quickly around the notion of independence. As a certain language, the language of revolution, the language of the national state. And so coming back to what I was talking about, about the languages that people speak, we have the establishment of the Prosorini Vikisi, the provisional administration at the beginning of 1822, and from then on, you have these endless texts and decrees and orders and laws that fill, I can't remember how many volumes, more than 20 volumes that the Vuliton Elinon published over the years, right? As we know, most of those decrees and laws are meaningless in the sense that they had no purchase on events at the time, but they have an importance. The importance that I see now is that they were written in a certain language, a certain political language, and all through the mountains and the, and the islands and the country are people who are learning to speak this language of revolution and independence and sovereignty. 
And that is what's really happening in the early years. So um, um, thank you very much. I'm trying to impact a lot of the, what you said so densely. Uh, and I'm just highlighting a few things, if you can comment. The first is, uh, you talked about Helene's Grecia, Greeks, Romney, uh, and we know that there's been a lot of controversy in these terms, which terms to use, uh, what is the appropriate term to characterize the, um, uh, the nation. Uh, and uh, then you also mentioned this interplay between um, national identity uh, and Christianity, religion. And again, when one look at, looks at these terms, there are many ways to understand it. What can, one can be a, a Christian um, uh, from a religious perspective, one can be committed to Christianity from a national perspective if, while being agnostic, for instance. Again, it seems to me that this is the time where a lot of these things are being played, deciding, uh, and, and uh, leading very often uh, perhaps to misunderstandings. That is, people speaking about Christianity in different ways, speak people using different words, but understanding them differently. Can we again talk to us a little bit about these kinds of maybe conflicting visions of what the nation is and the relation between nation to religion? Yes, although I think this is an area where you should be speaking as much as me. But, uh, um, of course, I can, I can respond to that. So there, there, there is this, you know, as I think we all know, and there's a lot of good new work on this, there is the language of Romeosini, of Romeos, uh, and there's the language of Elada and Elinas, uh, Elines. And uh, at the beginning, they have somewhat different valences for most people. The, there are far more people who will call themselves Romeos, mm -hmm. meaning obviously Orthodox Christian, and so one way to think about the epanastasy is the spread of the language of Elinikotita. And it's an example of what I was talking about. If you read the constitutions, if you read the legal decrees, everything is about Tonelinon. It's, it's the language of Elinikotita which is triumphing. Uh, it's triumphing, but it's transforming at the same time because the old theological objections so the connotation of Elenikotita, which is that it referred to the ancient Greeks and to paganism, is being forgotten. Elenikotita is now coming to be compatible with Christianity. And it's in documents like the various constitutions of the revolution that that new symbiosis is created. And by the end of, of the fighting, it's so strong as to be obvious to everybody. And I think wars and fighting can do that. Things can change very fast in wars, faster than they do in peacetime. And so there is this sweeping change of mentality in the decade of the fighting. And that's, I think, one of the most important changes of all. Afterwards, the whole language of Elenikotita has been naturalized in a new way. And, and of course, this language of Elenikotita, Elinas, et cetera, is very much linked to uh, movements that happen uh, outside of Greece. You mentioned philhellenism. Of course, many of these Greek intellectuals have studied abroad and brought back uh, ideas from the West, uh, which also created tensions, right, uh, between these intellectuals bringing ideas from the West and then the local people who may have been in admiration, um, but also somehow frustrated uh, or resentful towards what might seem like a for an imposition uh, of uh, bureaucratic structures or ways of understanding themselves. Again, can you, can you maybe as a historian talk to us about that international East-West, Europe-Greece part of the story? You know, I think one of the lessons I draw from this, which is maybe valid for today, is that it's extraordinary how countries manage to cooperate with one another, despite totally misunderstanding one another. <laughs> the misunderstanding, incomprehension is the condition of international affairs. And I don't think there are many better examples of it than this. The Greek revolutionaries, the smart ones, learn or know from the start there is no way they can prevail against the Sultan if they want independence by themselves. They need to have the uh, um, support of Europe. Ultimately, they need the support of the European diplomats and the European powers, and it takes a long time for that to come. The way to that is through European public opinion. 
because they understand very well, because the elite are part of the same milieu, that Europeans have this kind of weird love affair with ancient Greece. They don't have a love affair with ancient Serbia or ancient Syria. They have a love affair with ancient Greece, for good reasons, by the way. I was speaking as somebody who grew up on, on the classics. They have a love affair, and this is capital. This can be exploited. And so right from the moment that Petro Bey Mavro Michalis marches his men into Kalamata in March 1821 and issues the pre-written proclamation that the Spartans have arisen, which he addresses to the people of Europe. You get people in Europe saying, we've got to go, we've got to go to Kalamata because the ancient Greeks have, and, and, and in a way they genuinely believe that. And so it's hard now to re put yourself in the mind of a French soldier who volunteers, who sails off, who lands in Kalamata, and they go around saying, where is the, where is the Spartan army? Where is the Spartan Senate? And they meet the mayor of Kalamata, who, who's a, a, a little plump old man dressed in black, who was a member of the Filiqueteri in Trieste, who, who left Trieste because he was in debt to his creditors, and, and it hits them. They're in this new reality that really has absolutely nothing to do with what their heads have been filled with. So that incomprehension is really, really important. And then there's another dimension to it that I think is also important, which is what takes many of them there is um, a feeling of sympathy. So we're at the beginning, we're in the 1820s, we're at the beginning of many things in world history. We're at the beginning of the age of sympathy that we're still in, that the mark of a civilized person is to sympathize, to empathize with suffering elsewhere. So they, they are sympathizing with the suffering of the victims. And that's why one of the reasons why they go to the Peloponnese. When they go to the Peloponnese, by the summer and autumn of 1821, which is when the first of them reach it, Basically, the Muslims have been driven out of their towns and villages, holed up, uh, surviving in a few fortresses. And the Greeks in the Peloponnese, in the Morea, are triumphant. The, the, the war is not over, but they are dominant. And insofar as they see victims, the victims tend to be the Muslims. The, the Muslims in Tripolitza, the Muslims in Korinthos, the Muslims who've been enslaved. And so the same Philhellenes, pushed by the same desire for sympathizing with the victim, find themselves trying to protect the vulnerable Muslims who've been left as a result of the great cataclysm of the spring. And then of course the Greeks don't understand this and don't understand what they think they're doing there. And so then there's a second level of incomprehension. Very interesting. Can you, well, I'll keep this uh, about the Muslims and about in general, um, the, those whose voices are left out. Uh, we typically tell the story of the revolution in terms of big heroes, of intellectuals, uh, not so much in terms of, uh, of the minorities, but also women are not very present, uh, marginalized communities are not present. Uh, but before we get that, uh, you are someone who has thought not only uh, uh, Greece uh, on its own, but also what it meant for the world at large. And I understand how European, what European sympathy, sympathy meant to Greece, but also what did the Greek revolution mean for uh, the European system and the world system? What were the uh, implications? I think it's a fundamental question. Um, I have to resist the temptation to confirm the you know, attitude one finds often in Greece, that Greece is at the center of everything. But in this case, it happens to be close to the truth. The, 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 you know, the defining event of this era was the ending of the French Revolution and the defeat of Napoleon and the establishment of a conservative order in Europe in which Europe was going to be policed. Europe was going to be saved from revolution. And if there was going to be any kind of intervention, it was against revolution. This is why in 1821, there is no sympathy at the international level of statesmen for the Greek cause. But you know, the remarkable thing, and this is where I come back to COVID and persistence, is that the Greeks hold out long enough for that to change. So that by 1827, the Holy Alliance that to police the restoration is smashed because the British and the Russians of the French have decided they have to stop this conflict. And that 
is a transformation of the international order. It's the first time that the great powers are forced to acknowledge the power of nationalism. And the Greeks in that sense had won, not by winning a victory, but by not losing. It, it's the classic outcome of an insurgency. All you need to do is avoid defeat. They had avoided defeat, just, just. But they had avoided defeat and they had hung on long enough to see this change, which had only happened because of them. Result of that, which is why they then become an inspiration to the Hungarians and the Italians and the Poles, is this was really, as people become aware, the first triumph of nationalism in Europe. And I don't think we can talk about nationalism in the same way in the Americas. So one might want to say this is the first triumph of nationalism, the creation of an independent nation state in the world. And whether you agree with that or not, it's of fundamental significance. So it has a huge impact upon Europe. And it's a relatively small state too. I think you said this somewhere else, right? That then it's the principle that the size doesn't matter that much. Right. right? It's a small state, it's a minority, however you define Greek, which is a pretty open question at this point, it's a minority of Greeks, more of them are still living under the Sultan in the Ottoman Empire. It's a small state, but it has a majority Greek Christian population, and so a principle has been established. Can you, Professor Mazawa, say a little bit now about those who did not follow the trend, those who were, found themselves not understanding what's going on? The, the, you see, the losers of this process, like today we talk about the losers of globalization, the losers of, of that. Uh, what happened? Who, who were these people yeah. whose voices are less heard? That's a good question. Okay, so there are, there are a number of different categories of losers that I can think of. And depending on where you are, obviously, certain ethnic groups lose out in certain places. But let's leave that aside. Um, I think of a guy, uh, an uh, armatol called Yorgos Varnakiotis okay. from Rumeli. The armatols in Rumeli are, have years of experience in hedging their bets. And they hedge their bets as long as possible. Karaiskakis hedges his bets, Varnakiotis hedges his bets. Everybody is hedging their bets. They don't know, is, is the Sultan going to defeat Ali Pasha? Is Ali Pasha going to win? Is he then going to defeat the Greeks? Who the hell thinks the Greeks are going to win? Who would bet on the Greeks? So they are always hedging their bets. They're making kapakia, they're making private agreements with the Ottomans. This is normal operating procedure for them. For the Greek nationalists, this is treachery, but not for them. For them, normal operating procedure. The lucky or the smart ones make the right bet. Mm. Karaiskakis becomes one of the great military heroes. Everybody worships him. And Drutsos is a more interesting case because in fact, he doesn't make the right bet, but people forget that and, and remember his glorious uh, uh, contribution in 1821. Varnakiotis makes the wrong bet. Mm. Varnakiotis at a crucial moment leaves Mavrokordatos and sides with his old friend, Omar Pasha, and we have all the correspondence between them and with the other, with the other Armatols. It's all, 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 all in the archives. And he sides with, with uh, Omar Pasha. Later, he changes his mind again, but somehow he's never really forgiven for this. So you could say there is this large class of Armatols who are trying to do what they've always done. And there are some of them who lose out because they make the wrong bet. And there are others who really behave no differently, who end up showered with honors by King Otto. That's one category. I think another interesting class is the resistance that you see on some of the islands and in some of the Peloponnese, but in the islands, it's very clear. When the Eterists go to some of the Kiklades and they say, we are now the Greek state, we are now representatives of the government and we are collecting the taxes. Now, please don't send them to the Sultan. Mm -hmm. Not everybody says, great, we're, we're glad you're here. here. Here is our potatoes or our uh, uh, kalamboki or whatever it is, okay? And in some places you have a resistance that you could interpret as a kind of local resistance mm -hmm. or a radical local resistance against outsiders. These guys come in, they say they are the national government, but actually they're just from Idra. And why do we want to give our, our grain to Idra for nothing? 
So there is this local resistance, again, the imposition of a centralized state now. After the independence of Greece, we're all going to become familiar with this as one of the, maybe the central tension, right, of the local resistance to the centralized state. But you see it very powerfully already in the war itself. So there, I think, would be at least two examples. Um, and there are, there are other. What happens to the church itself is extremely interesting, of course. Right. Monasteries, right, that, that um, closing down monasteries because they don't fit the kind of new or, or dominant understanding of, of religion. And right? arguments amongst the monks in yeah. Megaspino about which side should we be on? You seriously want to resist the Egyptian army? There's, there's a dispute among the monks, which is reasonable because nobody knows how this is going to play out. Uh, I do understand we have little time because we are, I want to now start um, bringing in questions from the audience and there are many, but before I do that, listening to you, everything becomes so alive. Uh, and I wanted to ask you now as a historian, uh, there is the history that we learn at school, uh, which tends to be kind of um, fixed, rigid, not, not that moving after all. Uh, then. Uh, there is there are the debates that historians have had uh, throughout the 19th and especially 20th century. Uh, and then there is research that's happening now that many people who are not professional historians don't know of. Can you talk to us a little bit about these three aspects and then gaps between them and what remains to be done? How do you see this as a historian? Yes, I thank you, because I think this is very important. And I, I think this is a place to say that I could not have written my book and done my work without the really extraordinary work that historians, especially young historians, are doing in Greece right now. I think this is one way to understand it. The Obviously, governments since independence have, in one way or another, embraced uh, the idea of the resistance struggle. But none of them did that more than the junta. The junta was kind of fixated with 1821. More books were published in 1971, the 150th anniversary, than any other time. You had to, you had to acknowledge 1821 at school. You, by the end of it, by 1974, my impression was everybody was fed up. 1821 had been kind of, kind of fascist kitsch. And what, what was the result of this? That when you got this extraordinary generation of educators who came back to Greece from exile often in the, in the 70s, and they are the figures who really produced what I see as the revival of modern Greek history in the expanded Greek university system in the 80s and the 90s. Most of them wanted nothing to do with 1821. They wanted to have, uh, uh, there were two kinds of conversations if they got anywhere close. There were the liberals, I'm gonna be very crude about it. There were the liberals who said, what we should do is explore the ways in which Greeks were related to the European enlightenment. And there were the Marxists who wanted to have a class debate about whether there was a bourgeoisie and whether 1821 was a bourgeois revolution. Neither of them were actually getting stuck into the mass of figures in Greece uh, in 1821. This was not something that interested them, with some exceptions, especially around the journal Mnemon. This changed remarkably over the last 10 years for many reasons, one of which is it's such a great subject and the sources are so abundant. And the other, I think very important is the spread of serious doctoral programs in Greek universities in history. So I can tell you, having spent a couple of years on this, that the quality of the research being done in Greek universities is extraordinary. So, and, and will you see the first fruits of this being published? As you say, it doesn't trickle down easily into what people get taught at school or even what appears on television. There is a gap there. There is everywhere, but there's a big gap there. And my hope is that this gap will be narrowed because I have a feeling that what people learn at school ends up becoming a little dull. It's the same heroes, the same stories, the same, not myths because some of them are true, the same anecdotes, often mysterious in their implications, not really allowing you to understand anything that came before or after. And, and people are so used to the, the stories of Kolokotronis and Karaskakis that they're ready for something that is a little fresher and actually helps you understand a little better what actually happened. There were times when Karaskakis was important and times when he was completely irrelevant. And that's true of any of the great heroes. Um, 
so I think we're poised for a new era. My hope is that the Greek public starts to see what a treasure it has mm. amongst its historians. And, and the books are there. They're not always written for the general public, and that's fine. That, that, but but the, the serious research is being done, and, and it's very, very exciting. And of course, I, I, I'm sure that we'll get a lot of, of answers and then new questions while, by reading your upcoming book. Uh, but in the, as, as research agenda, as you now look at young historians, what were the, maybe in, in highlighting two, three, either questions or areas that you think are most important for research right now? Well, there are a few, and I'll, I'll be very brief. One is, um, you know, the problem in at this time above all is trust. Who do you trust? Do you trust this new Greek state? No, not really. So this is why the revolution is a time of marriages, of engagements, of powerful families um, into the marriage market with their sons and daughters. We know all this from the memoirs. It's only now starting to be systematically understood how important marriage strategies were to the political fortunes of, let's say, I, I don't have time to go into what Kolokotronis does with his sons, but it's absolutely fundamental to understanding his view of things. So that would be one. Uh, a second would be the, the, the situation of the Greek peasantry. You know, uh, they have to put up with the Turks. They have to put up with the Albanians. They have to put up with the Egyptians. Frankly, they have to put up with the Capitani and their men. Everybody is coming and wants what they have. And they are the sort of secret quantity mm. that somehow survive and somehow keep producing food for everybody else because it's not coming in from outside. How we understand the agrarian economy at the time is something we're just starting to get to grips with. And I think like all these things, the material is there. It, you just have to want to go and look for it. And then the last thing, and this is changing fast, you know, the history of the Greek revolution has been written as though there was only one side. Right? Until very recently, there was like zero interest in what the Ottoman policy was towards the Greeks, what the turnover of their commanders was, what the behavior of their troops was. It was just assumed they were sort of ravaging and plundering and on the whole, not doing a very good job, but being very nasty. Uh, but there was another side and it has archives. And over the last 10 years, the first work has started to appear based on the Ottoman archives. We now have the first published testimonies written by Ottoman officials. The, the one thing you can say about the Greek revolutionaries was they wrote, they wrote a lot. They wrote a lot at the time, they wrote a lot afterwards. So we have this abundance of material in Greek, but we're starting to see the material uh, coming out of the other side. And I think this is, you know, one of the great hopes for the future. Thank you. So we're a little bit uh, over time. So I'm going to bring in now questions from the audience and I'm going to group them so that we give um, um, floor to more people. So I'm, I'm going to say a few of them because I think they're linked together. So, uh, and some of them are quick and some of them are, are, you know, take longer probably. So number one, did non-Greek Orthodox Christians, both in Anatolia and also in the Balkans, refer to themselves as Romyosini? Uh, how does the uprising of 1821 fit in or differ from previous uprisings in the Peloponnese and Crete against uh, Ottoman rule. Uh, and then another one, uh, um, what did most Greeks mean when they used the term patrida, especially in the beginning of the revolution? Just these three mm -hmm. to start and then I'll bring more. Mm -hmm. uh, they, referred, they referred to themselves as orthodox, that's for sure. Uh, and I frankly don't know what, what the words they used were in Serbian or Bulgarian. And that's a really good question, actually. That's a really good question. And I'd like, I'd like to know. Um, the, the broader point is absolutely right, that uh, there are many Orthodox Christians uh, fighting in this war, bound up in this war, above all, of course, uh, 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 Orthodox Christian Albanian speakers, who will later become, as it were, naturalized Greeks by the memory of the war, all the Suliot leaders are, are fundamentally uh, speaking Albanian first and foremost, although they're communicating with the others in Greek and they're bilingual. Uh, the Albanian dimension, 
the Christian Albanian dimension, actually the Muslim Albanian dimension is, is a huge part of the story that I think people are starting to work on. How does this differ from previous uprisings? Well, of course, the, the uprising that was in everybody's mind when it started was 1770, 1769 to 70. Uh, the uprising uh, in the Peloponnese and, and elsewhere. Uh, and actually, uh, we know from some memoirists that the Ottomans are quite bewildered when the Greek uprising starts in the spring of 1821 because they can't believe that the Greeks are going to make the same mistake as they made in 1770. But the, I, I think that, so I think the origin is, is similar. But here's one important difference. I, I think among historians outside Greece in particular, the tendency had been until recently to downplay the role of the Filikieteria. Not to see it as a joke exactly, but to see it as something that was marginal, that mission was fulfilled in the failure of the Danubian principalities. And I think the recent work that has been done by a number of Greek historians demonstrates the fundamental importance of the Filikieteria's mobilizing of a large, large population in the year and a half, two years before the revolution. So I think that was the key difference as far as I'm concerned. And then there were differences in the international environment as well. Patrida means many different things and it means many different things. And for most people, I would wager right through the revolution, Patrida does not mean Greece. Patrida means uh, Calavrita or, or Gastuni or your valley. Uh, it could also mean the nation, the, na the, the national homeland, and it will come to mean that. Um, but there are many, many examples all the way through the revolution of people talking as though they have an allegiance both to their Patrida. Uh, uh, um, uh, Grivas talks at one point about Rumeli as his Patrida in the same breath that he's talking about defending Greece. So they're not incompatible, but their, their loyalties are inchoate at this point by, by our reckoning. I have two questions on philellenism and in particular in the US. Uh, what was the impact of the Greek revolution in the philellenic movement in the US? And then uh, uh, what was the role of the Americans in the Greek revolutions? Were they inspired by their own war of independence? Did Greek Americans play a role? Is there anything that we should? Um... Well, of course, we're going to be looking at this uh, in other venues in the course of this year. And it turns out to be a really interesting question. Um, to turn the questions around, yes, there were some very important um, Americans involved uh, right from the start, uh, the most important perhaps being George Jarvis, um, who fought all the way through until dying in 1828 and was a figure of some significance. Most of them were of peripheral significance in the fighting but important because they left records. Another would be Samuel Howe. And the second way in which they're important, and both of them turn to this, is that I, I think it's in 1827 and 28 that you can see in the United States the first really systematic focusing of relief efforts on the non-combatant population. And then they use people like uh, Jarvis and Howe and others as their agents in Greece. And uh, so there's a huge contribution. And then as part of that, of course, as we know, a number of Greek children, many of them orphans, get sent to America to be educated and play an important role there. The impact on United States itself is very interesting. I think there is a double impact. Um, there is a clear thread between engagement in Philhellenic activity and abolitionism. So there is this sense that you're fighting for freedom that somebody like Samuel Howe incarnates that will lead him and others around him to move more or less seamlessly from fighting for the Greeks to fighting for abolition. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I was just reading the other day a very interesting article in the first black owned and black edited a newspaper in the United States, which was called Freedom's Journal. And it was published in New York. And the front article about three or four issues in, in 1827, of these African American, free African American journalists was, we're listening to all the American Philhellenes going on and on about how urgent it is to intervene in Greece and to save the Greeks from slavery at the hands of the Egyptians and the Ottomans. And how is it that they're not 
apparently as bothered about slavery in the United States itself. So that was to me a kind of revelatory perspective that from the Africa, and there were indeed actually African-Americans who served in Greece and fought in Greece too. But from the perspective of these journalists in New York at the time of the Greek war, Philhellenism didn't lead naturally to abolitionism. It was a kind of weird alternative to it. Thank you. Two more, uh, again, about the, about the revolution and its meaning. One is um, the, um, the uh, those the position of those who uh, oppose the uprising but preferring to, as uh, the question says, Hellenize the Ottoman Empire from within, evolution rather than revolution. Can you talk to us about this view and then what do you think? And the other one uh, has to do with Philikieteria uh, the, and uh, whether or not the uh, impetus behind its formation was the economic downturn caused by the end of the Napoleonic uh, Wars. Mm -hmm. uh, and and whether this uh, is uh, makes sense, given that um, uh, it was second tier merchants who formed the Society of Friends. Mm -hmm. What do you think? So on Hellenizing the Ottoman Empire, certainly before 1821, many in the Greek diasporic elite did not favor military action or insurrection for that, for that very reason that they thought with time the Greeks were gradually taking over power and would continue to take over power within the Ottoman Empire. And so they opposed Ypsilanti's plans for an insurrection. And of course, that became a more difficult perspective after 1821, because the Sultan holds the Fanariots responsible to a large extent initially. But there is, of course, this interesting phenomenon after independence that um, Greeks move from independent Greece, from the Kingdom of Greece, into Constantinople, into Izmir, into Thessaloniki. And that's not necessarily because they want to Hellenize the Ottoman Empire, but it is an indication that Greek life did not end in the Ottoman Empire because of 1821. I, I would go further. We can now see from the work of Jelena Hardlaftis and others that actually Greek shipping and Greek business continued with the Ottoman Empire through the revolution. It did not stop. It did not stop. And so we have to start to see the revolution within this larger Ottoman context. The Filikieteria. Yes, it's a very striking fact that it tends to be the guys who got into difficulties, their boat sank or they didn't do well in business, who were um, pushing a guy like Papa is just, he has a talent for annoying everybody, getting into fights and arguments, being chucked out of one place, having to go somewhere else. So there is that, but I don't think we can reduce everything to economics. I don't think we can reduce everything to economics at all, because there is this tremendous resonance that their message has, which we have to explain. And I think the one reason why their message had a resonance was because they told everybody that the Russian Tsar supports this. And they went to pretty extreme lengths, including assassination, to ensure that this message remained intact. And so there was a sense that the time had come, that, that indeed this was going to be the moment in which the Russians went to war, which everybody had wanted them to do since the end of the Napoleonic Wars, and they had failed to do. And of course, Ultimately, the Russians do go to war. They go, they go to war in 1828. Uh, and, and that allows the final stage of Greek independence after the fighting has finished. So I don't think we can boil everything down in the Filikieteria to economics, but the economic dimension is absolutely fundamental. And when you look at the arguments on places like Idra, between those who are the Eterists and those who oppose the Eterists, it, it's really a question of class and who was in a relatively prosperous position and who was not. I have two questions that, that I think um, address the same theme. Uh, one is, um, why do you, do you think it took 400 years for the uprising to uh, come about? And the second uh, is um, about elements uh, that um, refer to um, or uh, highlight something like a Greek ethnic identity way before 
um, the, the end of the 18th century. Uh, and uh, uh, such as in demotic traditions, uh, all the works that Nikos Politis has done uh, and others uh, uh, in, in songs, etc. All these elements that um, highlight um, the continuity or some elements, some kind of national consciousness before the age of uh, imagined communities and, and uh, nationalism. And how do we strike a balance between, between, uh, between the two? You know, in the past, we tended to um, emphasize, of course, uh, uh, the, the you know some kind of homogeneity, continuity throughout history of, of the Greek nation, and then recent scholarships, of course, emphasizes the rupture, the fact that nationalism emerges in the age of nationalism, and then, of course, the pushbacks, saying, look, all the historical evidence that people were using the term Greek and Greek demoting. So, where is where is the right balance? What, what, what do you think? Yeah, the balance question is really interesting because, of course, we. Um, we meaning me, but maybe also your generation too, have grown up um, seeing, seeing nationalism as one of the myths that it's our professional job to kind of challenge. <laughs> right? And very much influenced by the notion of imagined communities. Uh, and yet at the same time, something happened. <laughs> something happened in 1821 that leads by 1830 to an independent state. So it can't have been either you think everybody just suddenly acquired a new consciousness in nine years or something was there to mobilize people. We come back to the question that I started with about epanastasi and uh, toromeko. Toromeko is a way of mobilizing people. It, it is not actually a, a nationalist way, but it can easily be accommodated to a nationalist way. And in the Peloponnese, it has the same effect as a, because you have a simple two-way struggle, more or less, between Christians and Muslims. So Toromeiko implies the triumph of Christianity. And it has the same, it's much more complicated in Rumeli, still more complicated in Asia Minor. Um, so I, I, I think that that's, um, I, I think that, that there is not a national identity as we would recognize it, but there is some sense of being distinctively Christian and Orthodox and waiting for something to happen. Hmm. It takes me to the first question, why did it take 400 years? Well, that implies that what you had in 1453, let's say, or was something similar to what you'd end up with. And of course you didn't, you had a very different polity uh, with people with very different values, including Christians with very different values. I think that what you have to try to do as a historian is put yourself back into the consciousness of Orthodox Christians of the 16th or the 17th century and ask how they saw time, how they saw change, who they thought was responsible for change. One of the prerequisites for the Greek revolution is the idea that humans can affect political change and not just God. I don't think by and large that, that existed in the 17th century, if I'm gonna go out on a limb. I, I, I think this is a fundamental transformation that comes through the French revolution and the example of Napoleon. And if you, if you cite the, the Taklevtika as instances of a Greek popular consciousness, then actually all you need to do is really read the Klevtik songs because the Kleftic songs in fact show you a far more intimate intermingling of Christians and Muslims and Klefts and Broesti than the national consciousness suggests. You have intimate relationships between Kolokotronis and Ali Farmakis, who is a Muslim Albanian Bay, that make no sense from a nationalist perspective. Thank you. So on that note, uh, I want to thank Professor Mazaur and everyone once more uh, for giving us a snapshot uh, again of uh, what uh, new history about Greece can do and also about the forthcoming book, which we're very much, I think, all looking forward uh, to reading. Uh, thank you very, very much uh, for sharing uh, your wisdoms and thoughts uh, with us. And I'm going to pass the floor uh, to uh, Mr. Philaktopoulos for, for some remarks. Thank you. Uh, that was a fascinating lecture, Professor Mazar. We are <laughs> we're very grateful for this tonight, and, uh, and we are very thankful to Nicola Prevelakis for extracting all this wisdom and those, all these 
uh, information from you with his um, very um, well put questions. Uh, I also want to um, say a very big thank you to uh, the um, to Her Excellency, Madam Ambassador, who put this uh, event tonight under her uh, wings, at uh, the embassy's wings, and of course to uh, our co-organizer, the Consulate uh, General in Boston, uh, and the Consul General Senator Seftimiu in particular. Um, the Bicentennial offers us uh, an opportunity to reflect on what, what we are really and how we started. And this is, I think, what we started doing tonight, um, thanks to our speakers. And uh, I think we need to also look at, uh, at some point where we're going, but that's uh, perhaps for some other people to deal with. Uh, let me say a, a few words about our next um, lecture. Some of the um, uh, uh, questions were concerned with the, uh, the, the input or the uh, role of uh, philhellenism, uh, particularly US philhellenism. Well, uh, that will be the um, subject matter of our next virtual lecture, which is coming up on the 17th of March. And that will be <clears throat> um, by Alexander Kitroev, professor of history at Harvard College and a member of CYA's Academic Advisory Roundtable uh, also. And he will discuss how, how the Greek Revolution and this revolution we are told by Mark Mazar, we should call it that, was perceived in uh, various parts of the United States. I think what uh, uh, Kitroev has done is he, he has looked at, uh, he has researched the press of the time and he has found that this was not an isolated uh, uh, movement centered in the um, East Coast of the US, notably Boston and Providence, but it was a, a, a far reaching. And uh, I heard the uh, connection with abolitionism today from um, Professor Mazar, and that's probably going to come into it. So uh, the next talk on the 17th uh, of uh, March is on American Philhellenism and, and their involvement in the, um, the Greek, or, uh, the Greek uh, Revolution. And speaking about that, I want to finish with a, uh, an, a note about today and uh, our Consul General in Boston informs us in uh, posting on his Facebook that on the 25th of March, the, all the large emblematic bridges of Boston, as well as uh, other th three other bridges in uh, other parts of Massachusetts will be dressed in blue colors uh, in honor of the Greek revolution and the Greek bicentennial. So, with these words, I want to thank you all for staying with us and uh, see you. See you in our next event. Thank you so much. Bye bye.